started. Uh, I want to welcome all the folks who are tuning in um, <clears throat> from uh, all around North America. Uh, Natasha, we've got not only uh, 50 or so individuals uh, tuning, but at least 10 of those individuals are hosting groups of anywhere from 3 to 10 people crowded into their living room or maybe at a local pub. You never know with our crowd. Um, <laughs> but we know there's a, there's a group in Detroit. There's a group in Portland, Oregon. There's a group, we think, in Minneapolis, uh, Kentucky. Uh, Jeremy Porter and, and company, uh, Gainesville, Florida. We think Vicki Machado got a few folks there. Uh, Rochester, New York, Elkhart, Indiana, Philadelphia. There's a crew watching. San Francisco, Toronto, uh, and just want to give a special shout out to Alan Jenkins, who is the one who first told me about you, Nataki, and I know he's tuned in from Atlanta, friend of yours, friend of the awesome. um, And I also said Duncan, is, uh, I see, has is, is come on, and uh, we'll talk more about the program that you and Fred are going to do in June, Nataki. Um, so welcome particularly to, uh, to Fred and, and everybody who's taken time out of their evening tonight. I want to be mindful of two things. One is um, it's later for Natasha than it is for us. She's very bravely agreed to start this program at 8.30 p.m. her time, and we really appreciate that. Um, but nobody can be tireder than this one right here. Sarah Thompson just uh, literally got in yesterday from uh, <clears throat> three months on the road uh, down in uh, Australia, New Zealand, West Papua, uh, down in that part of the world. So she's um, going to be battling jet lag, and yet she's really graciously agreed to come up uh, from Los Angeles, where she flew in yesterday, and sitting with us. I'm going to pop her up so she doesn't fall asleep. Um, but uh, Sarah had the opportunity to interview Nataki um, late December, was it, mm -hmm. in Atlanta. And that was kind of the beginning of, of this conversation. Uh, and so we're really delighted that Sarah uh, is able to be here with us in Oakview. By the way, there's also about a dozen people next door in our house watching this. So shout out to Casa Ana Schultz. So we got, a, we got a bunch of people here, probably 75 or more. Uh, and the reason for that um, is um, a couple fold. For one thing, um, just as Sarah rightly pointed out that today is the anniversary of uh, Romero, so a couple of days ago, Sunday, was World Water Day. Now, we in the U.S. typically don't pay much attention to what the United Nations is doing. But for the last 10 years, the U.N. has been promoting a Water for Life decade uh, in an effort to fulfill international commitments that various governments have made on water and water-related issues. You know, governments talk, but really without the United Nations, nobody's really uh, seeing if anybody's walking the walk. Uh, the focus of the decade has been on furthering cooperation at all levels so that the water-related goals of the Millennium Declaration, the Johannesburg Plan of Implementation of the World Summit uh, for Sustainable Development, and Agenda 21, uh, so all these things can be achieved. We are now at the end of the decade on water. 2015 is when it um, culminates. Um, and although consciousness really has built throughout the world around water issues, there continues to obviously be a huge need to continue to focus attention on action-oriented activities and policies that ensure long-term sustainable and resilient management of water resources, both in terms of quantity and quality, including measures to improve sanitation. Nataki is going to have thoughts on that. Um, for us in, in our circles who are tuning in tonight, water and justice are as inseparable as water and life are. 
and so we thought we would underline World Water Day uh, by talking with one of the most creative and respected watershed activists in the United States on tonight's webinar, uh, Nataki Osborne Jelks. Now, um, some of you uh, on the webcast tonight are, are new to our circle and for about the last four or five years we've been working on this concept of watershed discipleship which means to be a triple entendre that we are at a watershed moment as disciples of Jesus uh, with climate catastrophe interlocking ecological crises um, we are all whether we know it or not following Jesus in a watershed um, whether or not we're ignorant about that it remains the fact and thirdly we are invited to become disciples of our watershed in the spirit of what uh, the great Senegalese environmentalist put it we won't save places we don't love we can't love places we don't know and we will never know places that we haven't learned so um, our circles here in the States, our wonderful partners in the Canadian Ecumenical Justice Initiative of Kairos have adopted this framework of watershed discipleship. And uh, for us, what is particularly important uh, is that we understand uh, or that we try to clear up some of the confusion that often prevails when we use the discourse of watershed. Um, for one thing, when we talk about watersheds, we're not just talking about water uh, or just about environmental issues. It is true that the idea of a watershed is an ecological framework fundamentally, but we're also pushing watersheds in terms of social, political, and cultural frameworks, every bit as important as the ecological ones. This means that issues of social justice, including economics, race, and movement organizing, are intrinsic to any discussion of watershed health. Uh, now, this is a bit of a difficult sell to entrenched white environmental institutions, uh, but we think it's hugely important as we begin to unpack the meaning of watershed discipleship that at every turn we are looking for that integral, that intersectional understanding um, and to promote these intersections between ecological and social justice, never one without the other. Um, and that's why we're so excited to have Nataki Osborne Jelks with us today, um, tonight because she really is a pioneer of this intersectionality and we're we're just so pleased that you're with us and we look forward to, to talking with you and learning from you uh, and hearing about what you're doing. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sister Sarah and she's going to uh, begin our conversation. Uh, welcome Nataki to our webinar. You want to say hey from over there in Atlanta? Yes, thank you so much for having me this evening. She said it. Go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you so much to, to both of you. And it's good to be here today and welcome everyone. The places that we grew up form us. And so I want to give a shout out to the crew in Elkhart <clears throat> and uh, that watershed for forming me. And then often, the places where we went to school, whether that was formal training, you know, college or university or otherwise, but where we really got school, <laughs> you know, where we began to do um, the deep deconstruction of all that we had learned often in home watersheds happens as well. And so, uh, Aki, you and I share that school watershed of being Spelman sisters. And I remember seeing your picture in, in publications. And so it's been an honor to have the chance to talk with you um, and do this work together. Because that's what they say the sisterhood is all about. You know? So this is a really great opportunity. And I was wondering if you would start us in a little bit with talking about um, your home watershed and how that formed you to do what you also are working 
but you're in Atlanta still. And so that some of your journey um, in West Atlanta watershed started at Spelman. Uh, for those who are especially going through school or know others in university, can you talk a little bit about how Spelman in that area formed you as well? Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. It's uh, really a pleasure uh, to meet up with you again uh, and, and to be um, a part of this program. Uh, so I guess to, to really take it back, um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, the places where we grow up do form us. And I grew up uh, in a few places across the country. Um, I lived in Kentucky for a while. I heard there's a Kentucky crew uh, here today. Um, but what I remember most about growing up was my time living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And um, I lived in what is now uh, known as the Cancer Alley Corridor, um, this 100 mile strip of land between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, Louisiana, which houses um, over uh, 135 or so chemical companies, petrochemical companies, and other pollution genera generating facilities. Um, and living there for um, a time, I always recognized that the water smelled and tasted bad. The pollution index was always high. Um, the pollution, uh, the air smelled bad. Um, and you know, you know, questions sort of was happening. What was going on? And I lived in a, a, a middle class neighborhood, um, but we were still uh, in very close proximity to some polluting industries. Um, so you know, lots of questions. Um, began to pop up in my mind about you know what was happening you know in our local community and how that might impact us in, in some way. I didn't fully really connect those dots until I got to college um, here in Atlanta at Spelman College, um, and I came to Spelman uh, sort of as a chemistry major, uh, wanting to uh, pursue a dual degree in chemistry and chemical engineering. Uh, and began to do a little bit more reading and found out that this area that I grew up in um, had this name Cancer Alley and I you know I didn't know that when I was living there um, but it's been called Cancer Alley because of some of the highest rates of cancer birth defects and miscarriages that people you know have there um, really along the Mississippi River corridor um, and just having uh, you know some sense that perhaps we were um, being exposed to some things that uh, could impact our health uh, came became really personal when my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, and I was a student at Spelman at the time. And it wasn't that I could, you know, make um, a direct link to what we may have been exposed to in that environment and her diagnosis, but just the fact that that possibly existed really gave me the impetus to. Um, to get involved, um, to want to, um, it, it really, you know, sort of changed the course of what I wanted to do. You know, I started off as a chemistry, chemical engineering major, um, but up on realizing that um, in pursuing, you know, a degree in chemical engineering, um, that students are prepared, you know, to work at these, you know, same chemical and petrochemical companies that um, I felt, you um, were impacting my community in Louisiana in a negative way, um, that really steered me in another direction um, to want to be sort of a change agent, um, but to take um, those in the education, uh, educational training um, that I was getting to, um, to not work for those chemical companies, but to um, work to improve environmental conditions, you know, in uh, communities like the one that I grew up in. Uh, so that, you know, really, um, you know, was a sort of a watershed moment, if you will, uh, for me uh, in realizing that, um, you know, there were some some challenges that perhaps um, I could address if um, I took a certain path. And those opportunities were available there at, at Spelman, right? Like that was when you began. Um, There's a project or something in, in the class or an internship that connected you with the watershed that we live in in the Atlanta University Center of which Spelman is a part. Sure, that's absolutely right. Um, at Spelman under the mentorship of um, professors at that time in the in the biology department, um, we were actually beginning to build an environmental science and studies program at Spelman. Um, but there was a professor in biology who um, was sort of the environmental guru. And so I connected with him 
um, began to do research in his laboratory, and it was water-based research. Um, and from that connection, um, really ended up getting an internship with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And I worked in the Superfund Hazardous Waste Division. Um, and through work in that division, I ended up going to lots of uh, super fun sites, you know, kind of these abandoned, you know, toxic and hazardous waste facilities um, in the state of Georgia and meeting with community folks, uh, learning about um, their concerns and struggles. And um, through that, you know, connection, um, I began to, to see that I could sort of carve out a role for myself to um, to 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 be a to be of assistance to communities, um, but that also led me to think about um, the community in which Spelman was located. Um, and I learned at that point, you know, this is the first time that I learned, you know, what a watershed actually was. And I was taught that um, by local community members in West Atlanta who were um, dealing with issues related to Proctor Creek, um, which is the watershed that Spelman is a part of. And so, again, sort of another, you know, watershed moment um, in which, you know, I sort of had this internship experience with EPA, uh, began to see that, you know, I could, you know, as um, uh, a career or, you know, even if not uh, as, as a career, I could, you know, sort of begin to fulfill a passion um, to work to try to improve communities like the one that I grew up in. Uh, and I was given, you know, that opportunity and that was, you know, nurtured uh, at Spelman, even as a science major. Um, you know, there were opportunities to, um, to be mentored by professors in the social sciences um, who, you know, sort of had more of a, 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 a bend towards social justice issues. Uh, and, and from that, um, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. We've, we've got at least one um, water engineer on the on the uh, webinar in Detroit, and I know she's going to be chomping at the bit to uh, ask you some questions later on. I do want to remind those of you who have not been on our one on one of our webinars before that there is a chat box that you see in the lower uh, right part of the screen. You can chat in comments and questions, and we're going to leave some time toward the end of this webinar for you to get those questions in. Uh, Nataki, you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, are doing finishing your doctoral studies at Georgia Tech, I believe. Is that right? Actually, Georgia State University. At Georgia State, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and you um, continue to work part time with the National Wildlife Federation, um, where you've been an educator and an organizer. Uh, and on top of all of that, you've um, been one of the animators of this amazing project of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. Um, maybe you can uh, walk us through um, the, the birthing, um, the evolution of, of that particular uh, project. And uh, you, you let me know when you want to show some of your, some of your slides and we'll, and we'll put them up. Okay. We can actually go ahead and bring up the slides. Um, okay. That'll help me sort of stay on track with my narrative. And remember, you can, uh, you can click through okay. uh, using that. Arrow. So I'll get us started. Oops. There we are. Okay. Um, so I think there was an initial slide um, up at the beginning um, that just, you know, sort of simply said West Atlanta Watershed Alliance is trying to grow a cleaner, greener, healthier, and more sustainable West Atlanta. And so here you have a map, and I know it probably doesn't mean much to folks who uh, are not familiar with Atlanta, but the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance is a community-based organization that was founded by and is primarily governed by um, residents of three contiguous watersheds, um, the Proctor, Sandy, sorry about that, my is very annoying there. Um, so the Proctor, Utah, and Sandy Creek watersheds are three contiguous that um, are tributaries to the Chattanooga. Chattahoochee River. And the Chattahoochee is a, a river in our area um, that has gotten um, quite a bit of um, recognition uh, because of the challenges facing uh, this watershed. Uh, it's a river that impacts um, three states, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. And if you've heard anything about, you know, the water wars between those states, um, you know that there is, um, there has been some intense negotiation and and even, I guess, maybe recently more so a stalemate um, between states with respect to who has, you know, the rights 
um, to this river. Um, and there are lots of issues with respect to, you know, who is, um, I guess, sort of providing the most burden, toxic burden to this river. Uh, and part of that is uh, as a result of uh, some of the wastewater infrastructure challenges that we have in the city of Atlanta. Uh, so again, we're working in these three contiguous watersheds and um, communities uh, came together to try to harness collective power um, to try to address um, decisions that were impacting each of these watersheds. Um, the work really got started uh, in the Utoy Creek watershed, which is the, the largest uh, watershed here. Um, it's the southernmost watershed. And in this watershed in the mid-1990s, um, there was a plan on the city of Atlanta's books to essentially build a mini wastewater treatment plant um, to treat uh, combined sewage um, in a, a community park, a park called John A. White Park, um, which is in southwest Atlanta. And this was done um, uh, in a way in which the community was not engaged in those plans from the beginning. Uh, in fact, the city council person for that area um, did not know about the plans until money had been put into the design. Um, of, of this mini wastewater treatment facility. And up on notifying the community, um, the community began to rally around um, beginning to separate the sewers. Um, and let me just move to the next slide. Um, I, I talked about the Chattanooga just briefly, um, national significance. Um, again, these three um, contiguous watersheds flow into it. Um, um, Saki, can I just can I just interrupt to ask what are the headwaters of the Chattahoochee and and where does it end? Um, it, the headwaters are in North Georgia, uh, a place called Helen, Georgia, which is in North Georgia mountains, um, and it does let out into um, Apalachicola Bay, um, which is considered to be one of the most productive estuaries in the northern hemisphere. Um, so that's another reason why the Chattahoochee River is is so important, um, and for um, many communities in Georgia, it is a source of, of drinking water. Okay. So again, the challenge um, with the Chattahoochee and um, with the pollution in the Chattahoochee comes in part um, because of contributions from the city of Atlanta. Uh, and here I just have a, a map that shows um, the, the communities around the country who are still served by these combined sewer overflow systems. They're mostly in the Northeast, some in the Pacific Northwest, and then um, just a few in the Southeast. Um, but Georgia um, is the state, um, of course, right above Florida that has three of those dots. And so one of those dots is the city of Atlanta. Uh, and in some of our oldest neighborhoods um, in close proximity to downtown Atlanta, we're still operating on a combined sewer overflow system, a system that was implemented in the late 1800s uh, in, in Atlanta. Uh, and for those who um, may not be familiar with combined sewer overflow systems, I um, have sort of just a simple diagram here that shows you um, just very simply when there are normal conditions, um, there is, well, let me just back up. A combined sewer system uh, indicates that there is one pipe that carries uh, storm water, um, which is the water that is generated when it rains, um, and um, our domestic and industrial wastewater. Um, there's one pipe that carries a combined flow of those waters um, to a wastewater treatment plant. When the capacity of that wastewater treatment plant um, is uh, overwhelmed, then the overflow event um, that usually happens during heavy rainfalls. Um, and it happens quite a bit in the city of Atlanta because when um, the system was implemented in the late 1800s, um, you know, significant growth and development has happened since then. So you have a combination of lots more users uh, to the system, you know, lots of people um, with sewer connections in their homes and businesses. Um, and then because the city has been so built out since the time that the system was implemented, uh, you have lots of impervious surfaces, especially around the downtown areas. Um, impervious surfaces meaning streets, sidewalks, um, roads, rooftops, those things that keep the water from penetrating the ground as it normally would. So in heavy rain events, you have this mixed, you know, combined flow, which is at that point somewhat elevated, uh, needing to go to our treatment plants. 
Um, and if the capacity of those plants is overwhelmed, the system is designed to have an overflow of raw untreated sewage um, mixed with the stormwater, which is going to carry um, petroleum products, pet waste, litter, debris, anything that's on the ground is going to be swept up into that system as well. And so you have a, an overflow event um, into a receiving stream. That's very significant for the city of Atlanta because um, we have these combined sewer overflow systems that are built along the headwaters of many of our creeks and streams. These creeks and streams flow through front and backyards um, of residential homes. They flow through public parks, uh, school grounds, and other places where um, the public can, can readily access these spaces. Um, so it's very significant when you have, you know, disease-causing pathogens mixed with stormwater pollutants um, in the streams that, that flow through um, the places where people live. So in, in the 1990s, um, sort of circling back to um, the work that started in Utoy Creek, um, because there were um, so many challenges with our combined sewer overflow system, um, what the city ended up doing um, was um, planning to build out that system a little bit more. Instead of um, following a path to separation, and separation of the sewer system would um, mean that we would um, have two pipes, one pipe Raise the stormwater um, to the creeks and streams, um, and the pipe that carries the wastewater to treatment plants. Um, and in a separated system, we do, we do have a separated system in some parts of Atlanta, and we don't have the same water quality challenges where those separated systems exist. Um, and so instead of following the path to separation, what the city did um, was to put a Band-Aid solution on the problem um, in some people's minds, you know, a gaping wound, actually, um, to put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. And what they did is they built these mini wastewater treatment plants or combined sewer overflow control facilities um, along our creeks and streams. And one of those facilities was planned for the Utoy Creek area. Um, and the community, again, once they found out about it, um, we're able to develop a citizen's plan to defeat, um, you know, our city's plan and the city's consultant's plan. Uh, and in that citizen's plan, we were able to get sewer separation in the Utoy Creek Basin. Um, and um, all of the studies have shown um, that have been done that um, that sewer separation was a good thing for water quality. Um, and so Atlanta was really faced with lots of infrastructure challenges um, as we continue to be. Um, and Atlanta is not known for being that proactive uh, in terms of addressing those, those challenges. And this is an old cartoon um, from um, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which, which, you know, sort of shows um, this, uh, this kind of prevailing practice that has happened um, in which, you know, we don't really jump on um, kind of fortifying and shoring up our infrastructure until, you know, it's um, in danger of, of crumbling. Um, so, you know, to give you just a little bit of context around, you know, the time that um, Wawa's work was starting, um, you had these massive infrastructure challenges, you had what was going on in the Utoy Creek Basin, and that was really considered, um, um, most folks in the Utoy Creek watershed considered um, this potential placement of a combined sewer overflow facility in a community park um, without a community engagement process um, feeding into that. Um, you know, people saw that as a discriminatory wastewater treatment practice um, and one that they decided to challenge and ultimately prevailed um, in um, getting or gaining, you know, some sense of environmental justice for that community. Um, just to give you some further context, um, this is a map of Fulton County and um, all of the, the three watersheds that I showed you that, that Wawa um, addresses are all located in this county. Um, and I have a circle around um, the county commission districts um, where our watersheds are located. And so if you can see um, the, the key, you know, very simply, you can see that um, there is there are some disparities in terms of the concentration of um, hazardous waste, solid waste, and, and toxic um, release inventory sites um, in this county. You know, it's not that you don't have facilities in the northern part of the county, which is um, affluent, mostly white, 
Um, but, you know, there obviously is a concentration of these stressors um, in the center city, um, which is predominantly African American, um, and in the southern part um, of the county, which is also predominantly African American. Um, so just wanted to show you that as, as a little bit of context. Uh, and so um, really after um, the, the um, victory in the Utah Creek Basin, um, the community ended up needing to defeat yet one other plan uh, in the community, which was um, designed to build a, an eight mile sewage tunnel from the north side of town to south to southwest Atlanta and essentially waste from um, the north northern part of town as well as a neighboring county, DeKalb County, would be shipped to southwest Atlanta for treatment. Uh, so again, the community decided that perhaps there is another way to deal with the wastewater challenges that um, that you know this plan was developed to to address. And again, there was the citizens' plan, and, and the issue here was um, phosphorus control um, in our wastewater stream. And so, with the citizens' plan, um, the community was able to put forth a plan um, that. Um, we eventually got some elected officials to take up, um, to, to also be advocates for, and, and um, ultimately plan um, was eliminated to develop this sewage tunnel um, between the north side of town and southwest Atlanta uh, in favor for what the community um, suggested, you know, could happen to um, address the phosphorus control issues, and, and it worked. Um, so after, you know, the victory, um, we sort of decided that there needed to be an organization in place to not only address threats like the ones um, that I just mentioned, but to also be proactive in trying to protect and restore our watersheds um, and to take a true watershed approach, which um, not only includes looking at what's happening to the water, um, but it, it, it includes dialing dialing it back to the land um, with the understanding that what happens on the land impacts the water. Uh, and there are all of these other historical, political, and social forces that are also shaping the conditions of our watershed. Uh, and so it made sense for these three contiguous watershed communities to band together um, to try to harness collective power um, to address some similar challenges um, in those areas. Um, so here I've just um, um, given you a few pictures um, to show you some of the challenges that our watersheds face. Um, not only the watersheds, but the communities um, that are in our in these watersheds. And Wawa's perspective is that you know a healthy environment um, helps contribute to a healthy community. And so we've got to look at um, the environmental exposures. We've got to look at social stressors. Um, we've got to look at all that shapes you know, our watersheds and communities um, to really get an understanding of, you know, where those disparities might be um, and to get down to, you know, how we can really address quality of life issues in a meaningful way as we're uh, addressing environmental quality. Um, just another shot to, to kind of show some of the um, massive illegal dumping um, that we see in some of our neighborhoods uh, and some of our watersheds. Um, we, you know, have lots of vacant and abandoned housing. Um, in some cases, because people have lived along the streams and suffered from flooding and had to, to move out of their homes. Um, but we have these areas in our communities that um, people, many times from outside of our communities, come in and they dump in those areas. There's a lot of what we call midnight dumping happening, you know, after dark. Uh, when people, you know, aren't watching, um, people drive in with things like tires and trash and debris, and they dump them in uh, areas that um, they think nobody cares about. Um, so there are lots of challenges that we're facing um, in, in our communities. Um, and we really operate, Wawa operates on um, principles of authentic community engagement and collaboration, and we firmly um, feel that process is just as important as the results. The way that we go about doing our work, the way that others collaborate with us is just as important as the shared goals that we, that we may have and the end results that we, um, that we seek. Um, and so this is something that we have to constantly, constantly lift up 
um, because we have, you know, recently um, been able to partner with a lot of government agencies, other nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, and others. And, and people get really excited about, you know, the good work that can happen, uh, the good work that needs to happen to restore and to revitalize our watersheds. Um, but a lot of people don't have this kind of community orientation and don't understand that the community has got to drive these processes. Um, the community has to be at the core of any revitalization and restoration efforts that happen. And if the community is not at the core of that, our solutions are going to be mediocre um, at best. Um, and so we have to constantly lift up this principle um, in, in the work that we're doing in West Atlanta. Um, one thing that we try to do to, to really help to equalize the playing field um, is to um, work with our residents, um, work with our neighbors, and, and sort of train them in citizen science approaches. Um, and we felt the need to do that um, because in lots of um, lots of decision making tables and, and, and circles where decisions are being made, um, we find that we are sometimes discounted. Um, our community knowledge is discounted. Um, what we know about the communities that we live in um, is sometimes dismissed as emotional and not based on you know fact um, and and not based on you know credibility. And so we've. Um, found it necessary, you know, as we continue to do the advocacy work um, to build community capacity um, for folks to be engaged um, in um, work happening in our watersheds. And so um, citizen science, or what I like to call street science, um, is, it a, is an approach um, that we are actively implementing. Um, and, and we do it in a couple of different ways. Um, there is a way in which we are trying to help elevate community voices um, so that the historical knowledge that people have um, about our communities, how they started out, what has happened along the way to produce the conditions um, that we see now in, in, in our communities and in our watersheds, um, but also to give residents um, a say-so in um, how these um, challenges are addressed. Um, so part of this is, is really sort of lifting up that local um, knowledge and then in other ways, we are trying to, you know, teach people skills um, that will help them to, to get a seat at the table. For instance, um, in one of our watersheds, the Proctor Creek watershed, which is one of the most impacted and impaired watersheds in the city of Atlanta, um, it's, it's, you know, it's all the craze right now. Um, and and WALA has been working in coordination with community residents in the watershed um, for, you know, over um, 17 years to elevate and to lift up um, the challenges. And, and this was, you know, when I first learned of a watershed, um, I learned, you know, that I lived in the Proctor Creek watershed. And so um, I had this intense um, desire um, to see um, our entire watershed, you know, improved um, and to see the challenges to addressed. And so we've been working for, you know, over 17 years to elevate the community issues. And it really seems um, for a time that we were, you know, kind of like a lone voice crying in the wilderness. Um, until just recently, in 2013, we were able to um, get some, some national attention. And in, in part because of Wawa's persistent advocacy in this area, um, Proctor Creek has been listed as one of EPA's um, federal urban, um, urban waters federal partnership sites. And so this is one of about 18 pilot watersheds across the country that are being targeted for some collaborative work with EPA and its sister federal agencies. Um, and the idea is that these agencies will come together and make some investments. Um, it may not always be monetary, um, but to have some emphasis you know, on restoring these communities, on um, seeding the economy, you know, economic growth and development um, in these areas, and really um, getting to you know, waterways that, um, that people can enjoy. Uh, and so because of that and um, just because of 
Um, I think all of the possibilities in the Proctor Creek watershed, in addition to those federal agencies uh, and you know our city um, governments and state agency, um, we have lots of nonprofit organizations um, from the national scale on down to the local level who are now um, trying to play, so to speak, in Proctor Creek and have their you know ideas and plans about things that um, they can do to contribute to improving the water quality and other conditions in the watershed. Um, and the problem has been um, that, you know, as you have all of these organizations coming to the table, including uh, very well-resourced organizations, um, there has not always been this space for the community voice. Um, and again, you know, because um, folks in the community may not have scientific training, um, we can sometimes be discounted. And so those of us who do have scientific training have been working to design um, these citizen science or street science programs to, to try to democratize science um, to get, you know, our folks um, a seat at the table where, where they, you know, they already deserve a seat at the table. Um, but you can't, you know, argue or dismiss data um, as easily as we can sometimes um, de be dismissed um, if we're only perceived as, you know, being emotional um, and not knowing what we're talking about. Um, and so just to, to move into that, I just I only have a few more slides, um, but I thought that I would talk a little bit about Proctor Creek, a little bit more about it, um, because it's taken up um, a lot of our time um, these days because of the intense challenges, but also because of the opportunities that exist right now. Uh, so Proctor Creek um, is uh, a creek that flows about nine miles. It starts in downtown Atlanta and flows northwest out to the Chattahoochee River. Um, it's uh, a place, uh, Proctor Creek, you know, as the, the creek itself, you know, used to be a source of pride for West Atlanta communities, especially those in Northwest Atlanta. Um, it was a place where children played, where people could fish, uh, and a place where people were actually baptized. Um, so it had lots of significance to the community. And today it's polluted. Um, it's not fit for any of those activities. Although we do get some anecdotal stories from time to time that, um, people are still doing some subsistence fishing in the creek. Um, and just last week or so, I heard that in one of our communities in Proctor Creek that um, they, there might even be some kids who are still swimming um, in the creek. Um, but what we know about the creek is that it's polluted. Um, there are at least 29 documented pollution sources, um, and the creek does not meet its designated use for fishing. Um, there's a classification given to, to waters in the state, and so Proctor Creek, you know, should be able to, to be used for fishing. Um, but because of contamination, E. coli bacteria in particular, coming from our sewer system, this combined sewer overflow system, um, it's not fit for any of those activities. Uh, and so in 2013, um, Wawa launched in collaboration with two organizations, um, the Community Improvement Association, which is a resident-based organization in the Proctor Creek watershed, and Environmental Community Action, which is a statewide organization um, that helps communities across the state of Georgia to um, seek environmental health justice. We all pulled um, our resources and time together to um, establish the Proctor Creek Stewardship Council, and we um, did have some support from an Urban Waters Capacity Building Grant um, that helped us to do that. Um, and so in establishing this body, we wanted to pull together residents from the headwaters of Proctor Creek all the way downstream. And we're talking about over 38 neighborhoods, um, distinct neighborhoods with their own uh, character, with their own, um, you know, individual challenges and pressures, um, but with some common threads. You know, Proctor Creek being one of those common threads that flows through these communities, or in some cases, um, the creek itself might be piped over and underground, um, but there, we're, st we're still seeing some of the same challenges, you know, in those communities. And so we're talking, you know, blight, um, you know, vacant um, businesses, vacant homes, illegal dumping, um, you know, the polluted creek that flows through, um, you know, people's, you know, yards and parks and school grounds, um, and you name it, those stressors, you know, are, are showing up in the Proctor Creek watershed. And so um, we felt it very important to try to, again, to harness this collective power um, amongst residents of, of, the, of the watershed. Um, and it's been, you know, an awesome journey. Um, what we found is that, you know, people know, know things about their section of the watershed. 
And in some ways, folks did not know um, how far, far Parker Creek went. You know, they knew that it ran through their neighborhood, but they didn't know, you know, how far it went downstream. And so it's really um, an effort in grassroots, you know, community organizing to begin to knit together and to connect together all of these neighborhoods um, who have, you know, again, their own priority list, but we are beginning to come together um, with a common and shared agenda um, around Proctor Creek. Uh, and if we kind of use the creek as sort of a metaphor um, for the condition of our communities, you know, the creek is, is polluted yet resilient. Um, it's, you know, ugly and um, you know, not pretty um, in some places, but beautiful in others. And so if we can, you know, really restore and clean up this creek, um, then we know that um, we can restore and clean up our communities um, and make our communities whole and healthy, um, just as we can, can do that for the creek itself um, to improve water quality um, and the habitat that it provides um, for, for wildlife, um, but also to really impact, um, you know, the human communities um, and to see improvement and revitalization, you know, in those spaces as well. Uh, and I'll mention as I move on to the next slide that um, our theme for the Stewardship Council is, you know, take me to the water. And that is sort of derived from um, an old, um, you know, Negro spiritual. Um, but also because, you know, people in the community were saying that um, we don't even see the creek in all the places where it runs anymore because it's, you know, sort of overrun with overgrowth. Um, and invasive plants and, and all of these things. And so um, this creek that used to be this beautiful asset is now uh, in some ways, you know, an ugly eyesore, you know, and a nuisance, um, a liability, if you will, for the community. And so um, in taking, you know, folks to the water, we want to, you know, kind of unpeel all of that and restore it um, and bring it back to its former glory so that it is um, this, uh, amazing resource and amenity that connects us all, um, but that, you know, is also, you know, sort of the lifeblood of our community again. Uh, and so that's, you know, the, the end of my slides. Um, I have some contact information there if um, folks are interested in contacting me um, after um, this conversation is over. All right. Well, thank you for um, that excellent overview of your uh, of your work, and uh, Sarah and I are brimming with questions, and I'll bet many of our participants are as well. So we're going to take about 15 minutes, uh, Sarah and I, and, and ask you some questions, and then we're going to um, encourage our participants to use the chat function there on the bottom right of your screen to, um, to chat in questions, and I'll, uh, I'll try to keep track of those questions. Uh, just magnificent, the work that that you are doing um, ecological restoration and repair combined um, with community organizing, um, mm -hmm. really addressing what we might call sanitation apartheid, which uh, is, is an issue, of course, not just in Atlanta, just like there's transportation apartheid or education apartheid, mm -hmm. so too with the sanitation system, we mm. often don't think of that mm -hmm. when we think of the structures of uh, discrimination and injustice, and your work just daylights that in a really dramatic way. Um, we're, we're so appreciative. Um, so let me uh, start with one and then turn it over to uh, Sarah. Um, you, I, I know you, uh, there has been a, a couple of parks that have been really central to to the work of Wawa, which, by the way, Wawa gets the, the all-time award for best acronym around watershed work. Somebody really, I don't know if that was you or whoever, but that's just awesome. Um, but I think um, uh, both restoring some parkland in those neighborhoods of the watershed, but also connecting people with those parks and with the streams. Uh, I know here in Ventura County, one of the issues is low-income people are literally um, structurally segregated from the river. They, they can't get there because of freeways or levees, uh, you know, or built environment. Uh, and there are people living next to the living a hundred yards away from the Ventura River who have never been 
to the river. And it sounds like you were dealing with some of those issues uh, as, as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about the role of parks in sort of reconnecting folk, not only with, with the habitat, but with the struggle? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I mentioned, you know, earlier, we really started off with this, you know, sort of wastewater treatment, um, you know, approach, and we were um, involved in a lot of advocacy around um, our wastewater treatment system. But once we, you know, decided to step back just a little bit um, to, again, to be a little bit more proactive and not just reactive, and, and granted, there are always these threats that pop up that we've got to address. Um, but in a proactive sense, you know, and really sort of taking a true watershed approach, um, we had to realize that, you know, what happens on the land impacts the water. So, you know, how the land is managed. Um, is important. Um, and we felt that it was, you know, very um, important um, for people to be connected um, to, you know, to, to the land and water in our communities. Um, and, you know, again, for some folks, that's not, that's not difficult, you know, because folks live along these creeks and streams. Uh, so they see these streams, they run through their communities. Um, but, uh, in, in that work, um, and kind of going back to the Utoy Creek watershed, you know, again, there was an opportunity um, for us to um, save, you know, land in the Utoy Creek watershed um, that uh, it, it was land um, about a 220 acre, you know, property in total. There were a couple of different properties that were sort of assembled to make this, you know, large tract of green space. Um, but Utoy Creek flowed through this property. Uh, and so there was about 100 acres of that property that was slated for the development of about 121 single family unit homes. Uh, and so there were going to be some challenges in terms of the, the topography um, for that area. There will be challenges in terms of, you know, kind of uh, congestion, uh, you know, car traffic and transportation, um, but also some impacts to Utoy Creek because of that development. Uh, and so we were able to, you know, work with our, our neighbors uh, in the Utoy Creek Basin who had been um, really advocating for that land to, to be um, saved, you know, for about 30 years or so prior to that time. They were, you know, trying to, to make sure that there were, you know, different types of developments that did not happen on that property. And we had, you know, an opportunity, you know, things sort of aligned, conditions aligned for us to um, really push for the preservation of that of that land, um, which this Creekside property um, that could be used for environmental education, um, that could use for, be used for enjoyment and, and getting people out, you know, connected to nature, connected to the watershed, um, but also to this, you know, urban forest land um, that was a jewel, you know, in, in this community in Southwest Atlanta. Uh, and so, you know, through building sort of a multi-stakeholder coalition to do that work, we were, you know, a, able to, you know, sort of defeat um, a, uh, a proposal that two of our um, elected officials were, were backing, you know, to develop this property, you know, into these homes that um, were going to be, you know, in this part of our watershed. Um, and let me just say that, you know, in our three watershed areas, you know, the demographics span from um, people living below the poverty level um, to in some parts of the Utah Creek watershed, sort of a um, upper middle class, you know, community. But again, um, regardless of, you know, the, the socioeconomic status of folks, we're still dealing with some of the same environmental challenges. Uh, so in, in this part of the watershed, you know, these homes were going to be, you know, half a million dollar homes. And that probably doesn't sound like anything to folks out west. Um, but for Atlanta, that's that's expensive. Um, and so, um, you know, we were able to defeat, you know, that proposal and get this land preserved as green space. And so um, in total, we've been able to save about 400 acres of green space in southwest Atlanta. Um, and out of that, we've developed um, at one of those sites, this site that I was just mentioning, a new park. It's actually a nature preserve, the Hampton Beecher Preserve. Um, and then from that work, um, we were able to um, work on three other green spaces that are within, uh, they're all within three miles of each other in the Utoy Creek area. Um, one is the Outdoor Activity Center, which is where Sarah and I met up. Um, in late December. Um, and this is a 26 acre pres nature preserve um, in which we bring our community there um, to teach them about, you know, watersheds, to teach them about the urban forest. Um, it's kind of a gateway um, for environmental education um, that happens for both, you know, youth, but also kind of um, adult focused education as well. And so it, 
we found that it's been very important to connect people to these natural spaces um, to, to help them to understand the concept of not just the creek itself, not just the water, but the watershed. Um, and you know how, again, our activities on the land impact the water, um, but also how we can um, be revived you know, and restored through our connections you know, with the natural world. Um, and that can happen even more so um, when the natural world in our community isn't polluted. Thank you so much. One thing I initially meant to do at the beginning of this webinar, which is something that I've learned recently from my trip in the Pacific, was to take a moment to acknowledge the custodians, the traditional custodians of the land, um, particularly around the Chattahoochee today, the Creek Indians and others. This was was saying in Wikipedia, but the various indigenous people that move through that space. And then also just a moment as we let all the um, information that you just share with all of us around the country uh, soak in, um, just to take a moment to acknowledge the custodians, the past, present, and future elders of the places uh, where we live. And that may be us, that may be our relatives, and we may be settlers on that land, and now we are also entrusted to respect the earth in that place. So I just wanted to, to take a moment uh, to do that. Thank you. And speaking of being custodians, uh, one of the stories that you told me about, um, in addition to Hampton Beach and the Outdoor Activity Center, is the, the park on Cascade. And the fact that there's a waterfall inside the city of Atlanta and, and how you all um, made this more accessible. Can you, can you share that story of how you all also, right now, um, became and custodians of, of that place? Sure. So Sarah is referring to the Cascade Springs Nature Preserve, um, one of those three properties that I mentioned in Southwest Atlanta, um, for which Wawa is is a steward. And all of these parks that I've mentioned, um, I might add, are owned by the city of Atlanta, um, but they don't have the resources to maintain these spaces or to do any programming on the spaces to get people out to visit them <coughs> or to connect with them. Uh, a Springs is, is just a jewel. It's 135 acres, um, hardwood forest um, with a beautiful waterfall um, that if you saw a picture of it, you might think that you, know, you were in the mountains somewhere. Um, but it's right in the city of Atlanta within the city limits. And as sort of an underutilized you know, space in our community, um, Wawa sort of adopted Cascade Springs um, several years ago. And about 10 years ago, or actually a little over 10 years, years ago, um, we, you know, um, worked with the city of Atlanta and others to plan some sort of mass engagement days to all three of these spaces that we are currently working in, um, in which we just wanted to invite community out to, you know, take a hike, visit the waterfall, um, just to, to relax and to connect with these spaces. And the significant thing about Cascade Springs is that um, as a city park, um, it, it's a nature preserve, but it's one that is a gated uh, facility. And so um, it's open, uh, or it was open uh, before Wawa got involved um, from on Monday, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to about 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, so that meant that um, when folks were not at work uh, and, were, and when kids were not in school, Cascade Spring closed. Uh, and so on one of these community engagement days, we worked with the city and said, hey, can you you know, give us the keys. We'd like to open up the springs um, just for the weekend. And um, folks came in from near and far, but there were so many people in the immediate community um, around Cascade Springs. And this is a middle class community around Cascade Springs. But folks said, I've lived here 30 years and I never knew what was behind these gates because the door, I mean, the, the gate is always locked when I'm not at work and when my kids and grandkids are not at school. Um, and so we had to um, 
we heard the cries of the community um, on that day, and we had to go back to the city to say, we've got to, to increase access to this space. Um, it's an amazing jewel that we cannot deny. You know, And the city came back and said, we can't do it. Um, we don't have staff who are working on the weekends who can come and open and close the facility. So it just cannot be done. You know, if there are special events that you want to have, we can work that out. So we kind of went around and around um, and eventually the city to um, give us the key. Uh, so on the weekends, uh, every weekend past um, a little over 10 years um, since 2004, we have physically been going to open and close the gates of this facility every weekend um, so that people in our community and beyond can enjoy it. And people come from all over. We have geocaching and all of that there now. So, you know, people come from Mississippi and Florida and other states um, for the geocaching. And we get lots of locals um, from the immediate community and um, far beyond. You know, when people find out um, what a jewel this space is, and again, that it's in the city of Atlanta. Um, it's kind of still one of those, you know, hidden jewels, but we're trying uh, our best to elevate the visibility of it um, and to get more people out there to connect um, to Utoy Creek. Um, the tri a tributary to Utoy Creek runs through the preserve, um, and you just can't beat this beautiful waterfall. Um, but, you know, it's a beautiful space um, but there there was an issue with access and you know our community's access even a middle class african-american community didn't have access to its own green space um, to its own park land um, and we had to challenge the city on that and you know we didn't get exactly what we wanted um, in terms of you know them you know opening it opening it up and closing it um, but you know the best that we could get was to do it ourselves and we've increased public access tremendously um, and I think our community is better you know for access um, to that space indeed that activity like that weekly basis um, for me really exemplifies the third aspect of watershed discipleship in terms of dis discipling ourselves to the watershed like activities that are done on a weekly basis by wawa and others mm -hmm. collectively and i know you all do some water testing also very religiously let's say and all other activities are sort of free flow and you know we we disciple together right so these community events that that you all um, are creating, and I, I want to um, I want to ask about the, the community event that happened um, at the outdoor city center, particularly because you spoke about the social and political historicities that shape our relationship with land and water and where we live, and very potently in the U.S. South, but all over the U.S. and you know, until emancipation, um, we were enslaved and had a very disempowered relationship with the land and were demanded to extract at rapid rates um, till it broke the land and it broke us. Um, and that trauma is seared within us. And so the work that you all are doing, that we're doing is holy work, like it's putting us back together. It's like helping us remember our bodies and our bodies in relationship with land. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about the experience of bringing people for the first time back into the woods in a safe sense and um, helping us to um, reconnect. Can you share about the, I think it was called the backyard barbecue or something, um, but that activity that you uh, cultivated there. Sure. Um, for the past uh, four years, and this will be our fifth year coming up, uh, we have hosted something called the Great American Backyard Campout, and this is where I've been able to do a little bit of partnering um, with uh, the organization that I do some part-time work with, National Wildlife Federation, um, where I've been for many years. And it's actually a National Wildlife Federation program, but we have taken it and made it our own. Um, and at the Outdoor Act Activity Center, this 26-acre urban forest preserve where we have our um, education center, um, we bring out about um, between 50 and 75 families uh, every summer um, for this overnight camping experience, um, which is done. It's 
it's meant to be in a safe space for folks. We get a lot of first time campers, a lot of people who, you know, um, you know, grandparents with their grandchildren, you know, who um, have some of those memories um, that you, you know, mentioned, Sarah. And I, I think about some of our community elders and some of our first board members of Wawa who, you know, um, when we were talking about, you know, kind of saving this green space and working on these parks, they, you know, reminded us that um, in in the memory of a lot of our elders, you know, the woods was was not an inviting place um, for our people um, for for the reasons that you've mentioned, uh, and so this, you know, th there's some trauma, you know, associated for some folks, you know, with the outdoors and with the woods, uh, and so you know, even you know, as we find that we have taken young people out into you know, state parks and other places, you know, sort of around Atlanta, we kind of get, you know, stares, you know, sometimes about, you know, why are certain people, you know, in the parks that uh, all of our taxpayer dollars go into to building up. Uh, but we decided to, you know, create our own experience um, in the environment, you know, so close to people live, um, you know, close enough so that it wouldn't be, you know, so threatening for them. Um, but again, this safe space with people who cared about them, um, who could, you know, handhold them if need be um, in these experiences uh, in which we, you know, were inviting them to connect um, to our natural landscapes, to our communities in a different way. Um, and not only connect, but to connect with their families. Um, you know, in a way in which they could enjoy time, you know, in the outdoors together. And we can talk about some of those, you know, um, the, the, the historical, you know, legacies, um, but also, you know, um, come up with our own new vision for, for how to move forward, um, you know, in these spaces, understanding that they belong to us um, and that we belong there. Um, you know, I mentioned kind of the experience in some of our state parks, you know, getting these looks, you know, what are you doing with these, you know, young black youth, you know, in the state park, you know, you're making too much noise or, um, you know, why, why are you here? Uh, and so, you know, we're able to, you know, again, bring people to this safe space in which they don't have to endure those looks and stares um, and also learn about um, the amazing you know, legacy, um, the positive legacy our people have contributed, you know, up, you know, a lot of the parks and, and recreation areas across the country. And we can do that in our own backyards. We don't have to go, you know, an hour out of town. There's nature in our neighborhood that we can connect to, that we can be the stewards of and that we can enjoy. Speaking of uh, <clears throat> safe space and one of our listeners uh, talked about some of the Holy Week images that you um, invoked um, <clears throat> in terms of reclaiming a space of danger and threat for, uh, for new life. Um, beautiful Holy Week image. Uh, you're connected with the church. There have been um, uh, a couple of churches that have been very, very key to your organizing effort. Um, Talk a little bit about the role of, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of churches in the evolution of, of Wawa and how uh, how faith communities have been allies, but maybe also you've had to kind of make the case mm -hmm. in, in some churches for why this is important work. When Wawa was founded, um, you know, it kind of takes me back again to those early struggles in in, in Southwest Atlanta in the Creek watershed. And we actually had local pastors helping to lead some of those. Um, you know, one of my mentors, Reverend Richard Bright, who founded a church um, here in Atlanta, the um, Atlanta Good Shepherd Community Church, um, was very, very uh, instrumental and active uh, in the efforts um, to separate the sewer system in Utoy Creek, um, to dismantle the city's plan to develop this Utoy Creek tunnel, um, and um, really gave us, you know, that momentum and energy that we needed to, to bring, you know, folks together 
to formulate Wawa. Uh, and when we didn't have, you know, the pastors sort of really actively, you know, involved, um, they were still involved by offering up their sanctuaries um, and their fellowship halls as meeting spaces, you know, for the organizing work that had to happen um, for the planning work. And, and even if they weren't sort of knee deep in that work with us, um, they, you know, um, offered their resources, you know, to us um, to help, you know, um, fortify, you know, the work that we were doing. Um, so, you know, the role of the church, you know, cannot be um, uh, overlooked. Um, it, it has been critical, you know, to Wawa's founding. Um, when I think about the early work that I, you know, began in the Proctor Creek watershed, again, you know, church leaders in the Proctor Creek watershed opened their doors. Um, you know, helped us to, you know, put on forums, you know, with folks in the community to not only hear their concerns, um, but also to strategizing and thinking about how we could um, pull, to, you know, resources and, you know, technical ex expertise and whatever it was that we needed um, to, you know, advance some, some community goals. Um, so the church has been very important. Um, you know, more recently, um, you know, I think, you know, the church was there at the beginning, sort of along the way, um, maybe has not been as uh, in the work that we've been doing. Um, but we really now around this work in the Proctor Creek watershed are coming full circle um, to get, you know, church churches, you know, re-engage, you know, in, in some of the, you know, kind of everyday sort of, you know, organizing and not just to, to offer up their spaces, but um, to really, you know, begin to, um, you know, looked up their voices and, you know, to speak from their pulpits about, um, you know, the the issues um, and the challenges. And, and we have a lot of external forces that uh, are kind of helping us to make that case. Um, you know, the project area, um, with all of its challenges, is now, you know, sort of this area everybody's looking at and everybody to redevelop it and bring in this project. Project. Uh, and so that will also impact, you know, the churches themselves. Uh, and so, you know, we're getting a little bit more traction now in terms of, you know, the church uh, leadership, you know, really, um, you know, providing uh, some forms to talk to, you know, their hints um, and to, you know, that um, these organizing and environmental issues that the churches are doing uh, or trying to do in the community. I know that Sarah has another question, but before she goes, I want to um, invite again our listeners. Now is the time to chat in your questions. Mm -hmm. We've got about 20 more minutes, um, so don't be shy. Um, Aaron Fahey, I want to I want to hear from you in Detroit. Um, and uh, as because uh, Sarah and I, we can we can keep going. You know, we we're just so interested in this stuff. But I know that there's others who who have some questions. So. Type away furiously, uh, and as we watch those questions come in, I'll turn it back over to Sarah. <clears throat> as you were speaking about those who are interested um, in Proctor Creek at this time, I noticed absent from that list, perhaps to some extent, was some of the seminaries, and Atlanta would have a legacy in theological education. And why seminary comes to mind is because of the connections that we hear from Word and World or, or other movements around watershed discipleship talking about connections between sanctuary and seminary and the streets. And I saw after the festival of radical discipleship also the addition of soil. And then you tonight, Nataki, science too. We have an S theme going. Uh, but but what does it mean? Yeah, building building that type of knowledge as we would build theological knowledge, building ecological knowledge. That's the science, and um, we can come from many avenues on that, um, including yeah, transitioning science from an egocentric way of doing science to an ecocentric way. And, and so I was just thinking, hey, maybe next time I'm in Atlanta, we can we can go to some seminaries and 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 chat chat to them about about uh, what what we're seeing in that watershed so so that just occurred to me and um but that streets element so the importance of movements and people's movements so um you might say particularly well just to finish the talk just to say uh, particularly about the black lives matter movement and and how that's been percolating in your watershed or or how um, or how people are speaking about it, you know, as as they're tending the earth, or as that conversation is coming up in in the in the various uh, areas where you're at. 
Sure. So one, I did want to say on the seminary piece, there is a Columbia Theological Seminary um, that has, um, uh, they, um, one of the professors uh, teaches a, a course um, every, kind of like a May semester course. And um, for the past, I think maybe two to three years, and this was an Alan Jenkins connection, um, we've had students uh, from Columbia, you know, out into the watershed. Uh, but in the watershed, uh, in our watershed is, is a seminary, um, the Interdenominational Theological Center, or ITC, um, which is um, um, a historically African-American uh, seminary. Um, in, in the Proctor Creek watershed and um, through a very visionary president, uh, past president, um, Dr. Michael Battle, um, ITC really started to get engaged in what they call sort of theoecology um, and, you know, getting, um, looking, you know, as a seminary at, um, you know, what um, you know, kind of, kind of what, what are, t what the task or what the role for, um, you know, the church and seminarians, you know, is in the, uh, in, in the broader community. And so it wasn't just on a, a watershed, you know, basis, um, but you know, just what, what is our, you know, uh, responsibility to the earth. And so, um, Dr. Battle is no longer at, at ITC, but we're definitely hoping to build, and we're starting to make some inroads there, you know, to kind of build upon that work that he started to really, you know, kind of. Um, pull them into this watershed approach, you know, to, to kind of place base, you know, those, those efforts a little bit. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, but on the Black Lives Matter, you know, movement, um, I think there are a number of parallels. Um, there are lots of frustrations that people are feeling, um, you know, similar types of frustrations when we see um, what's happening, you know, across the country and even, you know, in the Atlanta metropolitan area, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a young man who was, you know, gunned down um, by a police officer and it was obvious um, that he didn't have a weapon. Um, you know, supposedly he lunged at the officer, um, but um, I think, you know, lots of folks agree that the course of action didn't have to be, you know, to take his life. Uh, and so we're seeing, you know, our young black men uh, being sacrificed, uh, in, in my opinion. And uh, it's very near and dear to me as a mother of, of a, a young black son. Um, and so I think a lot about, you know, this world that he is now a part of and how people will perceive him, how they will look at him and, um, you know, what challenges he will face um, because he is a young black man. Uh, and so, you know, our young black men uh, and not just men, you know, um, Black men and women are, are being sacrificed. And so, um, you know, people are, are talking about, you know, see the sacrifice zones that we feel like we live in as well. And so um, we might not be being sacrificed at the hands of police brutality, but there, there are these toxic assaults, you know, on our communities. Um, there is um, this, um, there are these attempts to, to you know, marginalize us um, and to, um, suppress our voices and um, kind of in a similar way that, you know, there, there needs to be a lot of community building um, to, to, you know, challenge um, police and, and any who will, you know, unjustly take, you know, lives of any citizens. Um, we've got to consistently challenge um, these systems and these structures um, that would, you um, deny us, you know, um, a seat at the decision-making tables um, at the places at which our, our futures are going to be determined. Um, so I think there's so many parallels um, when I think about um, uh, the young man who, you know, was, was killed in the, the police chokehold uh, in New York and, you know, that, you know, I can't breathe. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of... Um, you know, talk about that and still on Facebook, that's my Facebook picture, you know, I can't breathe. Um, you know, we can kind of think about, you know, um, the the air assault to our air, you know, not just our water. Um, there, there are just lots of connections and, and parallels to um, what's happening, you know, kind of at this larger societal level um, and what's happening, you know, kind of in our communities as it relates to the environment um, and, um, you know, the quality of life issues that we're all facing. Um, Nataki, our friends in Detroit uh, have been very deeply involved in the struggles around water justice there. I think you've been 
probably tracking some of those issues from uh, from a distance. Uh, and they're writing to ask, uh, you know, one of the big struggles in Detroit is the privatization of water and sort of water apartheid in in Detroit. Um, is privatization to what extent is that? an issue or a future possible threat in the Atlanta context? Um, that was uh, something that was on the table several years ago, and I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on when that was. There was a large debate on uh, water privatization. Um, and I think perhaps even with some uh, similar companies, as, um, as I understand, have been um, kind of the key players in Detroit, um, ultimately, um, we were able to, you know, overcome <laughs> this idea of privatization. But, you know, Atlanta has gone through that with water, with parks, um, and for, you know, um, African American communities and low income and communities of color, you know, in the Atlanta area, um, and, and not just those communities. Um, I, I think there was some widespread, you know, feeling that um, privatization of our water system, um, privatization of, of something that is. Uh, you know, should you know, water, you know, is a human right, um, and and privatization of those types of of, of rights um, is you know counterproductive, um, you know, for you know any, um, you know, you know any um, what am I trying to say, um, progressive, you know, society, uh, and so uh, we've dealt with that challenge. You know, who knows. Uh, it might rear its ugly head again, but for the time being, we've we've overcome that. Um, but we still have significant challenges, you know, with our water system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one of our uh, viewers is uh, in St. Louis, uh, wondering if you know anything about uh, what's going on around water in the city of St. Louis. Of course, that has been uh, a great deal of the focus or, uh, focus around Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Um, do, you, do you have any connections, know of people doing similar kinds of organizing and advocacy in St. Louis? I don't. Um, I do know some folks that um, were doing um, just some, you know, some, some environmental justice work um, that did not, you know, include water, um, but sort of, you know, exposure to toxic hazards and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm not familiar with um, the folks who are doing water-related work in St. Louis, unfortunately. One of the issues you mentioned in organizing, um, th this is an interesting uh, one uh, for those of us who, who are organizers, because we've seen it time and time again, uh, is the way in which communities uh, and community advocates are dismissed by bureaucrats, by corporate um, uh, lawyers, by uh, state-funded scientists. Um, there, there's this dismissiveness toward particularly low-income communities because of the emotionality of, uh, of, of their um, expressions, often in demonstrations or otherwise. Uh, and one of our participants is, is wanting to hear a little bit more about you on that, particularly as, um, you know, emotionality versus rationality. Um, rationality often being sort of the discourse of white authorities. Um, how does this break down along race lines, gender lines? Um, uh, saying a little bit more about the science mm -hmm. um, response to that, which is, which is really brilliant, saying, look, we, we actually know more about where we live, and we're, we're going to prove it to you by collecting data. That, that just seems to me like a really, really brilliant organizing tactic on, on Wawa's part. Well, we found that that tactic has been very important um, because, you know, our community members, you know, um, will go to public hearings, will go to, you know, meetings with city officials and others. And time after time, we were being told, well, we didn't, we don't have any records, you know, of those problems happening. You haven't heard about, you know, flooding in Proctor. Creek since 2002 or we you know we just we don't we don't know about you know what it is that you speak of uh, and there was one situation um, that really got my blood boiling um, recently in which you know um, someone I know who you know kind of works for a public agency you know called me and said you know you really need to you know sort of wrangle in you know the folks in the community um, because because they are sending us on wild goose chases, you know, sources are being used up, and they're talking about something that doesn't exist. 
and um, I thought, okay, this is <laughs> this is going to be a challenge. Um, but but there was really a simple solution to that. Um, so in this particular case, you know, um, we had some community folks who were concerned about illegal dumping of scrap tires, and we're talking thousands of tires. Um, you know. Creekside along along the banks of Proctor Creek, um, and you know they complained about it and asked um, our local municipality to go check it out. And you know they said we have no idea. You know it doesn't exist um, essentially. And so these community members, um, members of our Proctor Creek Stewardship Council, were able to go out take photographs. Um, they sent that information back. Um, you know, to the city and copied some other uh, government officials at other levels. And before you knew it, uh, the city showed up and they cleaned up the site um, and spent, you know, thousands of dollars to remove these thousands of tires that previously, you know, they said didn't didn't exist. They didn't know where they were. Um, and so, you know, that that's a very simple, you know, activity. Um, but we also have folks involved in things like water quality monitoring. Um, some of our water quality monitoring work has been done uh, in collaboration with um, another, you know, local organization um, that works on the Chattahoochee River, and they really have the laboratory, you know, space and, and that sort of thing. So uh, we get Wawa members and, and community folks, watershed residents, to collect the samples. Uh, and from um, those samples that we've collected, we were able to actually find that there were some high hits of E. coli bacteria around um, the combined sewer overflow facility in the Proctor Creek watershed that we actually helped to close. And so if those if the E. coli was still, you know, um, very high, then there was another problem. And so the city was then able to invest in some closed caption TV, you know, of the sewer lines and ended up finding about 12 or so illicit connections um, in which, you know, they these were probably really old connections that never formally tied into the sewer system. Um, but, you know, they were not disconnected. Uh, when um, the sewer was separated in that area and when people were flushing their toilets, it was the equivalent of that waste going directly into Proctor Creek. But through citizen science efforts, we were able to identify um, that there was a problem um, and that, you know, what people were saying was perhaps, you know, sewage in the, in the creek was not just, you know, some figment of their imagination. Um, so, you know, by, you know, training up, you know, community folks um, to make observations, to collect water samples, to document, document, document um, things that they see and where they see them um, that should not be happening or going on in the community has been, um, you know, very um, helpful for us to, um, again, get a seat at the table, um, to have people to, you know, listen to us and then use their resources to go back in the field. You know, obviously, you know, they've got to go check it out. Um, if we're talking about the city or other agencies. Um, but, you know, that's what we want them to do. Go check it out. Go see for yourselves. Um, but by bringing um, things to the table in the form of data, you know, in the language of decision makers, um, we're able to get um, the attention that we need to begin to address the problems and challenges that we're facing in the watershed. And this will be our last question for the moment, but... Um, your contact information is available, and Chad will be giving some other ways that we can continue connecting with you, particularly, and connecting our struggles together. Um, the crew in Elkhart is wondering, have you connected with the public schools, and what are some ways to go about that? Um, how did you begin? Um, so we, historically, we've been very active in the public schools and we are kind of circling back um, to working with the public schools. Initially, I actually helped to start up um, water quality monitoring programs in several of our public schools in um, the Proctor Creek watershed in particular, and then some in the Utoy Creek watershed. Um, and it really, at that time, just took, you know, going, you know, finding sort of a champion teacher, you know, in the school, um, getting a principal to, to sign on and to be on board. Um, and initially, it took me physically going to those schools and working with some classes in the schools to take kids out to the creek, you know, to do that water quality monitoring monitoring to teach them about, you know, um, uh, the stream, you know, what the impacts were and how we can, you know, all be stewards, you know, of our watersheds. And so um, that work has, um, you know, with 
um, changes in administration and teacher turnover. Um, it's not been, um, we, it's not something that we have consistently kept going, although there are little pockets of it. Um, and we have sort of a renewed interest and um, excitement and energy around um, really um, exposing, you know, our kids um, in the public school system to the watersheds in which they live. And so that's going to be one of the next major things that we do is to really push that education. Uh, there are some barriers. Lots, some schools don't want to get close to water at all for liability reasons. Um, but again, when you have these creeks and streams flowing through public parks and, and through school grounds, to us, it's a no-brainer. Um, and we've got to, you know, teach and, and engage, you know, our young people um, in their watersheds. Um, again, you've got Nataki's uh, contact information. Um, those of you uh, <clears throat> looking, uh, 90 minutes has gone so fast, Nataki, there's just so much more we'd love to talk with you about.